How does this make you feel? Uncomfortable? Okay. Welcome to the world of camera psychology. What is up guys, Sharpen here, and today we're doing a video which was voted instantly after being suggested. That makes me know that you guys really need this. So if you haven't figured this out from the title or the thumbnail, today we're doing camera psychology. Ooh. But first, I've noticed there's a lot of people watching me from Indonesia and the Philippines, and those people don't speak English. So I enabled community contributions to this video, as I probably should have done a while ago. And my friend, if you speak both the languages, I'd like to ask you if you could contribute to the community and translate the video for all your Indonesian friends so they can learn from my videos as much as you can. It would be much appreciated, both from me as well as Indonesia, so please. And now I want to ask you to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell, because I have a lot of animation content for anyone who wants to learn. That being said, I also launched my own merch. So if you ever feel like wearing something like this, now you obviously can. I took it off because it's hot. Whew. By the way, sorry about my voice. I think I caught something. That aside though, let's start. What is the camera psychology? Mostly known as movie language. Why do we need a movie language? Let's start slow. What are movies? What is filmmaking? What are you doing when you're recording a movie or making animation? Let me ask you differently. Why did you make that MGB fight animation in 2014 while it was popular? My my guess is, you've seen the NGB from someone else and it made you feel something. It made you feel sad or excited or happy. It made you feel something and you liked it and you said, wow, I want to achieve that with my audience. Was it like this? Because I sure remember that's why I started Divided. Being my most anticipated animation so far started from an inspiration from someone else. Why do we do this? Short answer, communication. By making your animation, you're sending a message. You want to make someone else feel what you felt. You want to make someone else feel all this excitement and rush and emotions. You're trying to send a message. It's a, it's a way of expression and communication. And camera psychology can help you send that message very well. If your animation is a letter, then camera language is the messenger. Luckily for you, I'm a multimedia student and I study this topic on a pretty big detail. And today I'll be giving you insights on how camera psychology works. Note, I've explained the camera language in a video before, but today I want to dive into it more specifically to my animator with some additional knowledge. So for the first part of the video, I've set up a small project where I can explain what the camera language is briefly. Or at least the first part. Definition. Camera language is a set of rules that allows the creator to communicate with his audience through the elements on the image. So if you know the rules well, your message is gonna send and the animation is gonna be... So let's start by taking a look at a few character positions. First character position, or frontal, builds the intimate connection with the viewer. The character here trusts him. I'm watching straight at the camera. I'm building a connection this way. I trust the viewer and the viewer trusts me because of the frontal facing. If I turn the character slightly, there is still the intimate connection but without as much emotional interaction. I still trust you but I'm not as involved because I'm turning my body away from you. Also what's important are the arms. Look at the arms here. He's now paying attention to the camera. If the arms are turned away, notice this? I'm paying attention to you, now I'm turning away. The rotation of the arms matters a lot because you tend to turn towards the person you trust or the person you want to build a connection with. If I turn away, I'm neglecting you and that's how the audience feels. You have to treat the camera in your project as the audience because that's all the audience is going to see. Imagine you're the viewer sitting in the chair and someone's doing this. Like the character on the big screen is doing this. He's neglecting you. Then we have the sideways turn and this is basically like more of a distant kind of feeling. The character is in his own thoughts. We want to know what's going on. The character preferably doesn't even know he's being watched, which, which makes us curious. What's in his mind? What is he doing? Then turning him three quarters away makes it look like he's turning his back on us. It feels like being thrown away. You can't see his face, so you're wondering what's in his mind. It's like showing the dark side of the characters. This is the way of neglection. This is the way how you can display, again, the dark side of your character. Using this shot in front of a big decision would make for a really awesome effect. Now the final shot, turning your back on you 180 degrees. The character is in his own world. You don't know what's in his mind. Is he thinking about good? Is he thinking about evil? You don't know. He's turning his back on you. And right now, you have nothing to do with him because he's cut off all bonds with you. He is his own person of whom you can only hope to do the best, but you can't know for certain. Also, notice how the arm are turned inwards. Like if I'm talking to you like this, I'm open, happy, want to talk about stuff, but if I do this, I suddenly feel closed and not as confident and I don't want to talk to you, I don't feel close to you, I don't want to express in front of you. This is open, happy, conversational, 
this means like, mind your own business. It's the same way with your characters. This is body language. This is how our minds perceive things. And the arms matter how they're turned. All those tiny things. I've said a lot of times that animation is very hard. Now if I tell you that you have to apply all of this to all of your characters at once, it gets harder. Imagine you're doing a scene with a whole lot of detail and a lot of emotion and then you play it back and see that your character on a microscopic level isn't showing the details you want it to be showing. He, he isn't expressing the emotions you want him to be expressing. Then you have to go back and troubleshoot. Okay, the pupils are slightly too big here. Let's make them smaller for, for the sake of the effect. You know what I mean? Micro details. And that that makes up a good animation. If you pay attention to all of that. Now let's move on to the second part, which are plans and perspectives. What is a plan? As mentioned in a video before, a plan is a distance from the camera to the object. This right here would be a wide shot. Why wide shot? Because it's showing a lot of area. There are four major groups. Wide shots, medium shots, close shots, and detail shots. All of which have subcategories, and together they add for a whole lot of plans. But I'm focusing on the four major groups. We use this wide shot to display the environment, to place the character somewhere, and to show an overall look at the scene. Then we have medium shots, where you show the character as a whole or almost as a whole. This shot in particular is the American plan because it cuts at his knees. This was used in cowboy films when the cowboys had revolvers up and they had to show the guns, so they cut it. Poor microphone, what have I done to you? Therefore, it's called American Plan. Forget this ever happened. We use this shot most of the time to display what the character is doing and stuff like that. Then we have close shots, which is basically to show a reaction, to show an emotion of the character. Then we have the detail shot, which are very close shots and they show some very important piece of information that the audience cannot miss. In this case, I'm showing the eyes, therefore I could make him look angry. So the viewer knows he's angry, something is going to happen. So that's basically the plans. Now let's talk about perspectives and I'm gonna use this shot right here, where the character has turned away. This dude has something on his mind. This is a normal perspective because the camera is in the height of his eyes. Is he the good guy or the bad guy? We don't know, he's thinking. He doesn't have a point of view. But if we do something like this, he's shown from below, making it look like he's the good guy. He's in a better position. He is superior to the viewer. This is pretty much casual. This suddenly feels like he has some important resolution to resolve in himself. If we reverse the process, showing him from above, he is unimportant. He has fell and he's done something stupid, being ashamed of what he's done. That's basically the psychological effect. You can see it here. If we increase this effect, he doesn't seem smaller. This is basically an overall look at the scene. Basically, this is happening. Objective. If we go for the other side though, the frog's view, this can make him seem like an evil overlord. This gives the character a lot of power and control. So try to experiment with this. And finally, let's close this section and open this section, which is the field of view and the depth of field. This is also very important. This shot doesn't seem too important, right? Let's try to zoom in. Well, this shot still doesn't seem important. What's missing? Oh, I know. How about this? This looks important. He has something on his mind. But what did I do? What did I change from this to this? Point of view. Field of view. I'm sorry. This is the camera here with a 45 degree view angle. When I do this, the camera suddenly shifts backwards, but the field of view is smaller. I did this. When you zoom in, the character suddenly feels important. Something is on his mind. You're focused only on that character. But still, something is missing and something could be done better. Oh, I know. Blur the background so he stands out even more. Let's not talk about the lighting here because I was honestly too lazy. Let's talk about the effect the viewer gets. He is focusing on the main character. Maybe I could increase this fade size a bit more so it's more realistic. Now let's try to reverse the process. Instead of going narrow, let's go wide. Let's just stick to what we did before because that looked better. But this wide shot could easily represent a large area or the group. This could be used in wide shots plus a wide field of view. This works good in conjunction. Next step, let's talk about composition. I've talked about how composition is important before. Now I want to explain how it works. This looks like a casual shot. How can we make it better? Let's try to do this. It does look appealing a bit. I mean, something is missing on the left side, maybe some text or maybe an object or something to balance the image out. But why is this special? Well, if we turn on this grid, he is positioned on the right side of the grid, like on this right line, which creates the rule of thirds. 
the golden cut, the Fibonacci spiral, all three names for the same thing. And this is very important because the composition is like the structure for the image. If the composition looks nice, the image almost automatically looks beautiful. Then of course the colors, the content and stuff, but composition is important. Let's try this in practice. What's up with this scene? Like what's going on? Bam! He is in the corner. The simple shot makes the image more valuable. Imagine he was walking down the road. What we could have done is rotate the camera slightly so he stays on this upper line. Okay, move the camera down a bit. Slight movements. It doesn't have to be exactly on the line, just close to it is enough. Next, where's the composition here? Let me tell you. The well is exactly in the center, which makes it a central composition. The edges of the houses are at the points. Now, those two bottom ones are not, because this city center isn't architecturally correct. I would rather focus on the well, because it's the main motive, but these edges here are still pretty close. It's not such a strict rule. Now this. What stands out with this image? Again, the rule of thirds. Like, the image itself is not too appealing. Why not? Well, I've cut out this house right here, and uh, that's ugly. Do not cut out motives. Try to do something like this instead, where you show both the house and the motive, and they're both in the shot. Preferably, something like this would look very nice, if this piece of grass was not interacting. Then, final one. Why is this one special? This one is very special. If I turn the grid on, you will see the tower is at this line, the house is at this line, the scenery itself has a horizon on the bottom line. So those are three components. This is a pretty solid composition if you ask me. One more thing I could try to balance out is place the flag in the corner. Like that would be an over the top composition if I managed to get all of this in one shot. Play around with this. The better the composition, the more appealing the image, the better the animation. Camera movements are also very important and they give off various psychological effects to the viewer. Let me explain all of them. First off, we have the camera which looks like it's being held by a person. Don't mind Oblivion's facial expressions, that's from before. That makes the viewer feel closer to the footage, like he's actually there. Not literally, he feels personally closer to what's going on on screen. Like if the character is gonna be sad and the camera is gonna move in like so, he's gonna feel empathy way more than he would if the camera was stationary. This effect is used to get the viewer closer to your footage. Next up, a very interesting one, the pan. It's slowly revealing what's on the other side, and this is a great way to build anticipation. You are the one who gets to decide what the viewer sees, and that is awesome. Next we have zooming in, or preferably moving in, because the camera is moving closer, not zooming, not changing the, f not changing the field of view. This way we build curiosity, we're moving closer, we want to know what's on his mind. Like, I'm thinking, you're moving closer. What's on his mind? This is a way to build curiosity with the viewers. Then in contrast we have moving out. Something happened and we don't want to be a part of this. A way to build a creepy atmosphere, something you don't want to be a part of it and you just want to move away from it. Then this one, the tilt. This makes for an unsettling effect. Something is wrong. Something happened and this is not a good wow voice crack. This is not a good place to be in at the moment. One of the ones that I love to use is changing the field of view. Zooming out and moving in. This creates such an effect. This is an emotional hit. Something great just happened and the character is completely out of his mind right now. What I have done, look at the field of view here. The field of view was increased, but the camera moved. <clears throat> voice cracks. The camera moved closer so the character is at the same place but the background is deforming and this is like an emotional impact as I said before. So trying to combine both the tilt as well as that emotional impact thing and you get an absolutely shocking scene. He is terrified like he saw himself lying dead on the ground. This is a good place where you would use this. Dynamic camera very good. There's also the crane or the dynamic camera which moves around the scene all the time getting all the shots and here's an example from Divided 3 because again I'm lazy to make it and I won't spoil Divided 4 any longer. This is basically a good way to make the viewer feel very interacted with what's going on and show him literally everything that's going on making him in the ultra position knowing everything seeing everything being in the middle of the action but of course that's better when you actually have action if something casual is going on using a dynamic camera is pointless then of course there is lighting Lighting contributes to the viewer's experience a lot, like the strength of the lights, position of the lights, relative position between the lights, all those matter. But I've talked about those so many times that I'm gonna skip them today, especially since this video is pretty long by itself. Instead, I wanna move on to the final two points, which are colors and exposure. And I'm gonna demonstrate with this here. What do you see on this image? I don't know, it's bright, warm, happy, 
everything is nice. It shows like those happy good old times where everything is great and it's happiness everywhere. What if I do this? Suddenly, it's winter, everything is cold, I can already feel snow is coming and it's kinda sad. Like, it almost feels like an army is marching in to devastate the lands and ruin all this. This is happiness. Everything is with This image is bursting with happiness. Whereas this one is just kind of sad and depressing. So colors matter. For example, if your character is having a hard time making the colors colder, it will add up to the viewer's experience. Like, the character is going to be sad and the colors are going to be cold. So the, the overall experience while watching this is going to be sad. He's going to empathize more. Kind of like this right now with the camera. For happy scenes, you can make the colors brighter and everything is happy. Look at what I've done with the camera. Everything feels so much better now. But those two scenes have one thing in common. They're both pretty bright. While one of them is sad, one of them is happy, they're both overall bright. So let's dim the image even more. A really dark atmosphere. There is no life here, there's clouds, possibly a storm coming up. Blech. So it's logical, the brighter the image, the happier the ambience. Just don't do this. But one thing also plays a role here. Look at this image, then look at this one. One major difference is contrast. It has nearly no contrast. Like, it's very smooth and diffused and everything is happy and naturally lit. This is pumped with contrast and this makes for a very dark and harsh experience. Lots of contrast can make the image but of course, don't do this because even this is too much. Like, I would not go for this. 15 is a lot. Like, these are sensitive settings. 6? And even this feels like too much. If I would have to do something with contrast, I would go for something like this, which is 3. If you do color correction, don't go for too much. We have reached the end of the video, and yet we haven't even scratched the surface of the surface of camera language. There is so much that could be said here, or diving into deeper into all the details on a professional level. For the sake of a YouTube video and Minecraft animations, I think this will do for now. One plus, when you master the camera psychology, or so-called movie language, you will have the knowledge to learn from your own mistakes, and you'll be able to grow yourself, which is good. That's it for today's video. I'd like to ask you to drop a like on this video because I gave off a lot of knowledge in this. Also, follow me on social media if you want to get to know the more personal me. You might even get some spoilers for Divided. If you want to get the merch, the link is in the description by the way. And again, if you speak Indonesian or Filipino and understand English, I'd like to ask you to translate my video or even more for other people to learn as well. Now that's it for me. Thank you for watching and stay sharp.